For all the saints, O oh God, dead and living, strange and familiar, articulate and silent, brilliant and ordinary. For all the saints, O oh God, we honor those who brought us to the faith. Surrounded by their cloud of witnesses, how can we not rejoice? Alleluia! Alleluia! Be seated. The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to Corpus Christi First United Methodist Church. I'm Pamela Dykehouse. I'm the senior pastor here. and We're without our associate pastor Marshall Van Pelt who is away uh, having some special time with friends this weekend. We look forward to his return next week. So 
If you are new among us, if this is your first time to worship with us in person or maybe online, or whether you're here all the time, we want you to feel warmly welcomed. We'd love to know who you are and that you're with us today and invite you to find one of the little slips of paper that's in the pew pocket, and you can either fill that out and put it in the offering plate, or you can use the QR code to let us know that way that you're here today. Um, Likewise, online, you can go to the church website to do that. Corpus Christi First United Methodist Church has the mission of helping people to experience Christ and his infinite love available to all. And Whatever brought you here to worship today, it might have just been habit, or it might have been the special All Saints celebration that we're doing today, or it might be something that has changed in your life that nudged you to go to church today. Whatever is behind your decision to be here online or in person We want you to know that that love of Christ is for you. Whatever's going on with you, know, if nothing else, before you leave this place today, that you are loved by God through Jesus Christ. So as we are worshiping, I invite you to take a look at the back of your worship program, and you'll see that there are opportunities for discipleship beyond the time that we're together on Sunday mornings. Several things that I want to highlight. I hope you'll look at all of them. There's always a way for each of us to connect. Highlighting today our mission team project to collect art supplies for Driscoll Children's Hospital. Read the details and participate with the collection boxes that are around the church building. Also, you'll see a short note at the bottom of that list of disciple opportunities about closed captioning. So I know If you've been worshiping in this service regularly, you may have grown accustomed to the closed captioning we've been providing for about a half a year now. We are letting that go for the time being, um, and so we are without it. If it was something you had grown dependent on, we would love to hear your feedback. You can contact Pastor Marshall, who is on that project, to let him know your thoughts about the use of captioning, how it was helping you, what your needs are. We want to be able to be inclusive of folks with difficulties in hearing. Um, However, that was not working out as perfectly as we had hoped for it to, and we are looking for other options. So please be in conversation with us if you have that need. Today, we have some special white baskets on the pedestals up here at the front of the aisle. These are for our communion fund. When we come to the point in worship where we have Holy Communion today, those baskets are for special gifts that are earmarked for our Benevolent Assistance Fund. This is different from your regular offering that goes in the offering plates. This is the way that we help neighbors in need in a variety of situations in life, keeping their utilities on, keeping them from eviction, helping them to get places they need to go for for their life. So thank you for your gifts that make that communion fund ministry possible. At this time, I am going to invite you all to stand and to greet each other. I hope that you will meet someone new, introduce yourself and share signs of the peace of Christ with somebody new today. And during that time, would the children come on up to the front after the passing of the peace, you'll join Miss Cherie for a special time for children. Let's stand and greet each other.
Okay. Good morning. How are you guys this morning? Yes? Good. Well, today is a very special day. You'll notice some things that are different around here. You might notice that we have an offerenda kind of behind us up there. Some special things up there. We also noticed the bells that came in. Do you guys see the bells that came in? Have you guys ever looked at one of these bells, Hudson? And you can kind of see your face in it. It's a little bit of a reflection. Do you see it? Pass that around and see if you see your reflection in it, kind of. Each one of the bells on those banners represent one of our saints, one of the people that have been a part of this church but have gone on to live with Jesus up in heaven. And so they're not lo no longer here with us, but we remember every time, in fact, not just All Saints Day, but every time we come to take communion, Cooper, do you know we think about when we say the communion of saints? Thank you, Varea. Can I have it? Thank you. When we say the communion of saints, we remember all of those people that came before us. Now, who's this? A baby, yeah, okay. Does the baby look familiar at all? It is me. It is me. Oh my gosh, did you guys realize that I was once a baby? Now, who, have you guys seen any of these people before? Yeah. Uh, my MM shirts. You've seen that? Too? Yeah. So these are all three of my kids. And, uh, and something I've been told since I was a baby all the way to now is how much I look like my mom. Does anybody ever get told how much they look like a parent or act like a parent or things like that? Because you might be told one or the other. Oh. My kids get often said they maybe look like or act like either my husband or me. And sometimes, you know, that's a good thing. We want them to act like, they, like us. And sometimes you don't always want them to have all the things that you do, that they see you do. So, but think about that. When I think about that reflection and the people that I just called saints, I remember that who do I want to reflect? Who do you guys think I want to reflect? What do you think? I want to reflect God. I want to reflect how Jesus is, right? I want to love others. And ultimately, as much as I'd love for people to say, oh, your children are just like you. More than that, I want them to say, oh my goodness, your children are so like Christ. They so show love and kindness and joy and peace and patience that they reflect who God is. So as, remember, as we remember the people that are no longer with us, um, I'm going to make an announcement, not just for you guys, but for everybody. We have put on the bells for all the people that we're going to read names for in just a little bit. If there is someone we have missed that you would like a bell included for, we do have bells that we will have up here available for you to pin a bell onto the bell um, banners during communion. So, with that, my friends, let's pray. Dear God, thank you. Thank you for the gift of all the people who've come before us, who are the saints, who are living with you now. And God, we hope that we, in our lives, are a reflection of you through our love, through our joy, our peace, our patience, our kindness, our goodness, Lord. We reflect you in all that we do and all that we say. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may head back to your seats. Thank you. Oh, please stand for our scripture reading, if you are able. The scripture today is taken from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, 
and that is who we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. The word of God for the people of God. On this All Saints Sunday, I thought it would be good to take a glimpse into the life of a saint who has impacted everyone who's worshiping here today, whether you're with us online or in person. I promise this saint has impacted you at least this much. So in 1688, Susanna Annesley married the rector of the Anglican Church at Epworth, England. And there, in the rectory at Epworth, Susanna brought into this world 19 children. God bless her. Ten of whom, though, only ten of whom, survived to adulthood. That's the way it was in those days. Susanna was not unfamiliar with large families. Brace yourself, she was the 25th child born to her parents. The 25th child. Her father was a well-known dissenting minister, meaning that he was in outspoken disagreement with the Church of England, which was the church of the land, the church of the day, and he was not that and he had a congregation outside of the Church of England. He was also unusual for his day in that he had a requirement that his daughters, not only his sons, would be educated. He had an extensive library because he was a person of some means, and he encouraged them from the earliest days of their ability to read, to dig into that library reading all manner of history and theology and biblical literature and beyond. And he encouraged his children, daughters included, to establish their own views on things, to challenge ideas that they did not agree with. Well, Susanna's life very much reflected that she was her father's child. She embraced his freedom of thought, and at age 12, she decided to join the Church of England (laughs) despite her father's position against it. See, that's the danger in teaching your children to think freely. (laughs) This detail of Susanna's childhood foretold the independence, the fortitude, and the spiritual vitality that is evident throughout her life. And all of those are traits that she was very much going to need in her marriage to that Anglican rector at Epworth, whose name was Samuel, y'all know some of them, the last name? Wesley, that's right. So Susanna Annesley became Susanna Wesley, and if you know anything of Methodist history, John Wesley, their child, is the father of the Methodist movement that became the United Methodist Church. Well, Samuel Wesley was really bad with money. I mean, really bad with money. They rarely had sufficient means to provide for their family. Twice, Samuel was locked up in debtor's prison. Wouldn't you like to find out your preacher was in debtor's prison? (laughs) And One time, he left and went away from the family for more than a year over a political disagreement with Susanna. I have to tell you what it was for. She didn't say amen at the end of a prayer because Samuel had prayed for the monarch with whom she disagreed, and he left for over a year. Twice, their home, the rectory, for the church, was burned to the ground. At least one of those times, 
It was evident that it was caused by parishioners who were disgruntled with Samuel. Don't y'all get any ideas? <laughs> You'll be the ones going to prison. Where do you live? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I keep my address. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> he apparently was not the most pastoral of pastors. My point in all of this is to say that hardship was the Wesley family status quo. And it was not infrequent that Susanna found herself having to care for the family on her own. And even when she was there, she was in the lead for that. She not only tended to household and education of the children, but with the intellect and independence acquired from her father, Susanna stepped into spiritual leadership of the congregation at Epworth during that time that her husband had that extended separation from her. She saw that no one was effectively leading it, and as a woman, Susanna could not teach or preach in the church the way I'm doing right now, but she crossed boundaries, rarely tested in her time, inviting people into her home where she taught and led worship for a large contingent of the people of the parish to the chagrin of the curate who was left to be in charge of things while Samuel was away. Susanna was a seasoned instructor and organizer as the tasks of teaching and feeding and otherwise managing her large household required much skill. She was good at it. While she was separated, while Samuel was away, she wrote him a letter in which she told him how she had devised a system of making sure to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with each of the children, rotating through a roster of the children each night so that each one got her undivided attention for a period of time so that there would be no doubt how she loved and treasured each of them. Early in Susanna's adult life, she had made a commitment to God that she would always spend at least as much time in prayer as she spent in any entertainment. Well, you know how it worked out. She didn't have any time for any entertainment. There was no, no balancing act to do there between prayer and entertainment, but rather having a difficult time carving out moments for prayer, she developed a habit of taking her apron and she would pull up her apron over her head and the children knew that when mother was under the apron, she was in prayer and must not be disturbed. Her strength, intelligence, and faith, independence, deeply shaped all of her children, but most particularly those two famous sons of hers, John and Charles. If you look in the back of the hymnal in the index, you will see that we have many hymns in our hymn book attributed to, written by Charles Wesley, and there are thousands more. He wrote thousands of hymns. And John, as mentioned already, was the father of the Methodist revival movement that ultimately led to the founding of churches like ours. Clearly, John and Charles are their mother's sons. Her influence was woven into the fabric of the Methodist revival movement. Some specific things that have strands that go back to Susanna are that the Methodist movement included non-ordained lay preachers, which was radical in its day. It included women in roles of leadership from its earliest days. And at a certain point, her son John was trying to decide whether or not it was okay to preach outside the confines of a Church of England pulpit. And his mother encouraged him that if it would bring the word to people, preach in the fields. And he did. And it was one of the, the trademarks of the Methodist movement. There is not only an imprint of Susanna upon John and Charles, but even upon the Methodist Church. And so back to where I started today, and I said, I'm going to tell you about a saint that has influenced, impacted all of our lives. Even if you've never been in a Methodist Church until today, the fact that there's one standing here that you came in today 
we owe a debt of gratitude to Susanna, who is rightly called the mother of Methodism. As a mother myself, now and then somebody has observed to me something positive in my children Caleb or Eliana, and seen something that they attribute to my influence on my children. And I'm glad when I hear that. That makes me happy. I have joy and pride in seeing my children reflect the better of my traits and values. And you know, sometimes I see them reflecting things that I thought, oh gosh, they really did get that from me, didn't they? I'm sorry. But when I see that they have picked up from me something good, my heart is happy. On this All Saints Sunday, maybe you are remembering a parent or a grandparent or a child whom you have loved and lost. Perhaps they were a reflection of you or you of them. I know that those recollections are not universally happy and good. Days of remembrance like this one just as easily stir up difficult memories. The parts of someone's life who would be best for no one to carry on to the next generation, right? We have to be realistic about that. May you find healing, if that is you, may you find healing from those hurts and embrace that which blesses you from the lives of those who've gone before us. So when I was a child, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 that we started with today was a memory verse for me pretty early on in my childhood, and I learned it from the New International Version of the Bible, which is not the one that we read from this morning. But I want you to know it as I learned it from the NIV. So would you read it with me now? See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. So the reason I've always loved that translation of it that I learned from early on in my life is that word lavish. We don't use that word a whole lot, but it always stuck with me. God the Father has lavished love upon his children. Like Susanna's father loved her. Like Susanna loved Molly and Hetty and Martha and Kezia and Sam and Ben and John and Char. Oh, you get the point. There's more. <laughs> and like I love Caleb and Eliana. And like you love, fill in the blank. And like you have been or are loved by, fill in the blank. And to whatever degree that person you filled in the blank with has lavished love or received that love from you, multiply that thousands of times over to start to try to get an understanding of the way that God lavishes love on God's children. It's just dripping over us. It's coming out our pores. He's just pouring it on us and all creation even when we don't pay attention. So the second part of verse 1 observes that the world may not recognize that we are God's children, because the world did not recognize that God came to humanity in the person of Jesus. So let's just say that somebody who knows me really, really well but does not know my daughter happens to meet her while traveling out in West Texas where she lives. And after they talk to her for a while, and they discover her perspectives on things, and they see her mannerisms, they see her facial expressions, they find out some of her values, the person might say to her, you know, the longer I've been talking to you, I'm starting to think that you remind me of somebody that I know back home. Any chance you're related to Pamela? And that's the way God means for it to be for us in this world. His only begotten son, Jesus, no longer walks on this earth in a physical body among us, but God is made known to the world, to other people, through us, God's children. 
The love that God has lavished on us is ours to embody, to reflect, to pour out and lavish upon other people. And the ideal is that by knowing us, they will know our Heavenly Father. That our lives will so reflect him that he will be known in us. The way that he is made known is through our lives being transformed to more and more and more reflect the love he has lavished on us. So Susanna's son, John, preached about this transformation. If you read no other sermon of John Wesley's in the course of your life, go online. You can find it. It's there somewhere for free. The sermon is called The Scripture Way of Salvation. It's written in some English that you'll find challenging from those days, but read it nonetheless. Before we know God, Wesley says in that sermon, before we know God, already he loves us. He is lavishing love on us when we are yet clueless about God, paying him no attention. Wesley compares this to being on the porch of God's house. He calls, Wesley calls, this place prevenient grace. Grace that goes before our knowledge and understanding of God's love. Wesley's understanding is that once we have come to know the love of God, we step in the doorway where we acknowledge our need of God for repentance and forgiveness through Jesus. The doorway is what Wesley calls justifying grace, when we choose to be in relationship with him. Next, in Wesley's description of this transformation, we enter into the house of salvation, where we dwell with Jesus. With the help of the Holy Spirit, we grow more and more and more like our Heavenly Father. And Wesley calls this sanctification or sanctifying grace. Can you just picture that? So the house that you've been looking at is the the current rectory at Epworth. Um, And I've stepped foot in that house. Probably some of you have in travels as well. Um, So that is the the third of the uh, parsonages there after uh, two others burned. Um, And can you just imagine that that house represents the place where there is the dwelling of the lavish love of God, and that when we enter into that house, we are just dwelling in that place where God's love is so pouring over us all the time that we start to behave and look and act more and more like our Heavenly Father. The very last verse of our short scripture reading today speaks of God's children becoming pure or holy as he is pure and holy. This does not happen in a flash. I don't know anybody ever, and if you do, I want to hear about them, who stepped into relationship with God and all of a sudden their whole life was just spick and span, just holy and perfectly reflecting God. That usually isn't the way it happens. When we immediate, it change immediately when we realize that God loves us and we are his child. It takes time. It's a transformation process. For this influence to take root deeply as we dwell in that house with our Father. So think of how Susanna, in that house, shaped her children through daily lessons, through those special one-on-one weekly times that she had with each child, and even through things as simple as their observation of her with that apron over her head in prayer. What effect that had on them. Verse 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. So the saints whose bells were ringing earlier, who we sang about in the opening song and will again in the closing, the saints know what we cannot yet They see our Heavenly Father face to face. And they know what it is to be completely sanctified, made holy, 
by God's grace because they are in his presence. Whatever ways, when they were dwelling on this earth, they did not yet look like him, now they are glowing in the glory as they reflect fully his light now. This is what we have to look forward to when we join them there. And in this, we can have peace on this day of remembrance. Peace even while we grieve that they are in the presence of God now. In the meantime, we've got living to do on this earth. In the meantime, let us choose to dwell in our Father's house, enveloped in his lavish love, surrounded by that sanctifying grace, being transformed day by day as we dwell in his love, growing with each little step along our journey as his children to look just a little bit more like him so that somebody might look at you and say, you remind me. You remind me of somebody. You remind me of your father. May it be so. Amen. Today we celebrate Holy Communion. In the United Methodist Church, we have an open table. So if you've happened upon being here today and are unfamiliar with this, know that you are welcome to receive both the bread and the cup if you wish to. It's also okay if you choose not to participate, but you are welcome to. As we gather at the table, we remember those in special need of prayer who are not able to physically be together with us at the table today. Specifically, we want to lift up John Lewis, a member of this congregation who is hospitalized today. We want to lift up the family and friends of Alfreda Rankin, who passed away on November 1st. Her funeral or memorial service will be this Thursday afternoon here at the church at 1 p.m. in the chapel. Also, we celebrate and give thanks to God for the birth of Jonah Link Page on November 2nd. His mother is the director of our Vincent Morris Children's Center, Rebecca Lundy. She and her husband, Jason Page, and big brother Elias welcomed Jonah, who is perfect, she says. As we join at the communion table, I want to direct your attention to page 23 in the front of your hymnal if you would like to have the musical notations for joining in the sung responses to the communion liturgy. Cherie joins me at table so that we can share together in the liturgy today. Would you please stand? Please say these words. Patient, forgiving, forgiving spirit. spirit, we come seeking, seeking your face. We hold on to ancient angers and hurts and refuse to believe that you alone can make, can make all things new. Like Mary and Martha, we have forgotten your promises of eternal life. Like the crowd that mourned for Lazarus, we have not believed that we would see your glory. Forgive our unbelief, O God. Bring us back and restore trust in you. Take a moment as you confess your own prayers in your heart. The Holy One shows us a vision of a new heaven and a new earth where everyone will live in peace and blessing, trusting in God's promise to wipe away all of our tears. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, God of Abraham and Sarah, God of Miriam and Moses, God of Joshua and Deborah, God of Ruth and David, God of the priests and the prophets, God of Mary and Joseph. God of the apostles and the martyrs, God of our mothers and our fathers, and of our children to all generations. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ by the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit on the night in which he gave himself up for us he took bread gave thanks to you broke the bread gave it to his disciples and said take eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me when the supper was over, he took a cup of wine from the table. He blessed it. And he said to his disciples, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with all your saints, especially those whom we name before you today. Elaine Ritchie. Deanna Fires. Peter Mahaffey. Walter Skinner. Meredith Klassen. Ludwig Vaughn. Jason Armstrong. Virginia Whitney. Richard Durham. Dan Davis. Harlan Heitkamp. Lon Hill. Bart German. Mike Edwards. Sammy Stakemiller. Ann Vaughn. Nancy Sullivan. Jack Painter. Jacqueline Hosey. Benny Stewart. 
Vivian Woods. Elaine Campbell. Barbara Clark. Alfreda Rankin. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, strengthen us to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Though we are many, there is one loaf, because we are one body in Christ, who has given himself for us. There is one cup of blessing for the forgiveness and reconciliation of all. As I mentioned earlier, everyone is welcome to receive both the bread and the cup if you wish to today. If you would like to receive by our uh, standard method of sharing communion, it's called intinction, you'll come forward with open hands. A small piece of bread will be placed in them, which you may then dip into the cup of grape juice, taking the bread and the juice together. If you require gluten-free, they're on a small tray here, which will be within your reach as you come forward near the table. And if you prefer not to share in the common cup for dipping the bread in, we have prepackaged grape juice with the wafer on top, um, also within your reach on the table to receive that for yourself. I remind you that the baskets are here on these pedestals along with hand sanitizer. If you are going to be making a gift uh, as we do each month for our communion fund for benevolent assistance, I welcome you to put those offerings in there. You're welcome to kneel for prayer. Um, after receiving, you'll come down the center aisle and return by the side aisles to receive. Come and receive these good gifts. Those who are assisting, if you would join Cherie and me up here.
Thank you for that beautiful music. Today on All Saints Day, we're so grateful for those that have gone before us who had the foresight and the generous spirit to establish the church's foundation. I don't know if any of you have ever watched the movie Coco or not, but it is a great movie. It's a Disney movie, Pixar. Um, if you wonder what kind of a scene it may look like up there, it might give you a little bit of an idea, I'm sure. Um, but it has a wonderful uh, ending where everyone is gathered together and you can almost feel, and you can see them in the movie, but I feel that way today in this church. I feel like all those who've gone before us are here with us right now. Amen to that. Um, their gifts that for those that have given to the foundation are a blessing. Those that have given to the church, your gifts are a blessing. The people who have gone before us, they are a blessing in so many ways. We offer scholarships, um, college, educational scholarships of all kinds, capital improvements, church camp even. Um, some people specified their gifts. Others have given and allowed the foundation to give in, in many ways. So let us all be inspired by them today and always to make similar gifts and invest in the future of the church's ministry with gifts like theirs. These are timeless gifts that last beyond a lifetime. Please fill out the card in your bulletin. If you didn't get one, it looks like this and you can grab some if you'd like or for those of you online, um, you can shoot the, shoot the church an email. Um, and so if you're interested in learning more, place it in the offering plate um, or return it to the church office. But I thank you guys so much and uh, we are, can go into prayer for that. Thank you.
as we prepare to leave this place, remember that you are a child of God. Reflect the love of your Father in the choices that you make, the words that you speak, the actions of your daily life, so that someone might look at you and see that you look like your Father in heaven and know him through you. May you go with that good news in your heart and on your lips with the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit upon you now and always. Amen. Thank you.